So I hope everybody can see it very well. Um, so the, the topic has already been expressed, and I think that uh, it's already been indicated that one reason why this is a timely topic is this is the 25th, the silver anniversary, as it were, of the uh, Agriculture and Fisheries Modernization Act passed in 1997. When it was passed, there were really very high hopes that finally we have this law that will consolidate all of the efforts of the state and various stakeholders. We are the, the the, the, the Philippine agriculture was already feeling the effects of renewed intensified competition from the newly passed uh, agriculture, um, uh, World Trade Organization accession and the uh, Agricultural Tarification Act. So there are really high hopes of a transformation. It's also timely because right now we're uh, in the middle of a transition. No? In, a, in a couple of weeks, uh, we'll have a new uh, administration and we will also be presently uh, having a new administration, even in the Department of Agriculture and agriculture related uh, agencies. So really this is a very timely to be offering a volume, assessing the past and looking towards the future of agriculture and fish and modernization. So the volume that uh, we are now preparing uh, with efforts from various uh, distinguished experts in the field of agriculture and fisheries, policy and assessment and analysis, uh, focuses on these questions. How far is the process of modernization gone? Can we say that it's on track? Is it moving ahead, no, pleasantly, or lagging behind? Which you might suspect is the case. What are the future prospects for continuing or completing? So when, when, so modernization, 1997, maybe by 2022, it's not yet finished. So when can we expect it to be finished? And what policies uh, do we do we need to put in place to ensure that it is indeed completed in a you know realistic and timely fashion? Now, this is not the first of uh, the assessments of AFMA. There are numerous. Uh, there were several major ones. Uh, I would submit that the way these other studies were conducted were not actually designed to answer these questions. They had different emphasis. I'll be explaining what those different emphasis are. Uh, in, in a while. Now, when AFMA was launched, actually, when you read it carefully, there is an underlying theory behind it, no? implicit in its various provisions and statements and declarations. It stated that the context of agricultural modernization is modernization of the whole economy. No? Uh, the modernization of the whole economy is described by a common term we've heard no? since, since we were. Uh, studying history, economic history, say, in high school, which is industrialization. So we have heard words of industrial revolution, for instance, and the need for a country to become an industrial economy, as opposed to an agriculture-based economy. So even though the hope is agriculture modernization, it is understood that a modern economy must undergo this kind of process. And I won't be able to go into detail uh, about all of the theories about uh, this, this development phase of an economy. There are various explanations in the literature related to dual development. Uh, these are also more classical or neoclassical approaches. Um, for instance, one reason why the agriculture sector uh, uh, shrinks, as pointed out in the introductory, uh, in the introduction by President Babes, it actually shrinks in relative size to the rest of the economy. One explanation is because actually uh, a lot of demand is local and the local demand actually shifts away from uh, food and agriculture related goods towards manufacturing and service related goods and services. Uh, as the uh, per capita income of the households in the economy grow. Uh, on the supply side, there is a shift away from the more labor using and land using uh, uh, activities in an economy towards the more capital using activities in an economy, which tend to be in industry and also uh, some types of sophisticated services. As the amount of capital uh, accumulates in an economy, as you can see in many industrialized economies. So uh, amplifying a bit on one of those, which I find very important because this will help explain some of the trends uh, I'll be uh, discussing in a while. The dual development hypothesis first propounded by uh, the Nobel Prize winning economist uh, Sir Arthur Lewis talks about a traditional sector. He didn't actually call it agricultural, but in not so many words you can guess, a lot of the activity here is agrarian, no? 
that's where there's a lot of labor, but it's sort of not fully employed. There's a lot of surplus labor in that sector. And wages in that sector are driven towards kind of subsistence level, not really based on the actual economics of the use of labor. Meanwhile, there, there is starting to exist in a nascent stage of an uh, the, uh, early stage of a developing economy, a modern sector. So it's a matter of the relative size of the two. Uh, mostly traditional uh, 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 underdeveloped economy will have mostly most of resources in the traditional sector and a very small modern sector. In an industrial economy, there's a predominant modern sector. So in the modern sector, it's very different because you have their labor where the, 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 the use of labor is more attuned to its scarcity. So it's being paid according to its actual contribution to the production process rather than persisting in a surplus. You know? So uh, the, the capitalists in that sector behave competitively and they're also capitalists. So they are also the venue of capital accumulation, whereas in the traditional sector, there's hardly any uh, investment and capital accumulation going on. So economic development consists of a transfer of labor from the traditional to the modern sector, driven by capital accumulation uh, in the modern sector. Now, uh, one of the implications here is a lot of countries will have to bear with a long period of stagnant wages before you start to see a turning point, you know, where the wages throughout the, the economy start to increase. And for instance, this is uh, commonly cited in the case of China, where there are many years uh, up to you know, 70, 1970s, 80s, 90s, where wages were fairly stagnant. Then starting 2000s, it started to go up. Uh, a few years after they actually joined the WTO and they saw uh, even accelerated growth of their already very fast economic growth. No? Now, uh, later writers after Lewis pointed out that when you have population growth, it's not a simple, you cannot just trust all the development to the uh, uh, modern sector. If, if indeed population is growing, there's an added onus that the agricultural sector in order to help propel the process along, and this was pointed out by uh, Ra uh, Gustav Ranis uh, and, and uh, John Fay, that you will need also technological change, not just in the modern sector, but also in the agricultural sector. And that will be uh, essential depending on how fast population is growing in order to drive or, or sustain uh, uh, the term they use, the process of economic modernization. Now, if we find that process kind of moving too slowly, so, you know, we, we might say, oh, instead of becoming a Japan or South Korea or Taiwan, we're more like, you know, some of the uh, laggards that we see in sub-Saharan Africa, at least before, or in Latin America. If we're more of the latter than the former, then maybe there are constraints to this general description of the process. So I would like to classify, and I inferred this from the reading of the basic law of AFMA, but there are constraints classifiable as macro, micro, and meso-level constraints. So if you have difficulties in shifting uh, labor as a whole or resources from a traditional to a modernizing sector, then I would classify that as macro constraints. So these are cons uh, rigidities to intersectoral migration, uh, factors that slow down the rate of capital accumulation, especially in the modern sector. So uh, even though so this, this harks back to the embrace of AFMA for the role of agriculture, even as it, it, uh, it, it, it accepts the reality of a structural change of the necessity of industrialization. Another set of constraints going down to the micro level, it's at the farm level. And here also AFMA places its attention say to the adoption of new technology where many of the farms in the Philippines seem to be lagging behind. And why is that so? Maybe the farmers lack information. Or more particularly the case, they might be subject to various market failures. They may be unable to access finance that is needed to uh, fund the, the, the usage of new technology, say the acquisition of new tractors for mechanization. They may also be have problems in finding the labor It's, it's easier to drive machinery. It's not that easy to drive a worker, especially in agriculture where you know, it's not like 
kasambahay in your own home where you can see what what they're doing, right? Then you can assess the quality of work. If you have a, a plantation of 100 hectares spread out quite, quite uh, you know, and the workers are dispersed throughout, it's not that easy to supervise them, no? So market failures in labor and also market failures in land. And here is my segue, actually, to the next one, to the next set of constraints. But before that, let me just comment that AFMA provides for interventions in particularly these micro level constraints, no, in technology, in credit, in information, addressing information issues. Now, getting back to land. Actually, land, when you consider it, in the Philippines, there's a high degree of fragmentation of land. And a lot of farmers are compelled to act individually with those fragmented land holdings. Now, this is not necessarily the case. You know, they could actually, there's a counterfactual where they could actually band together and act uh, together collectively. And previously in the past, a large hacienda uh, could actually impose this from the top, a uh, top-down system, right? So the capitalist would say, okay, I'm gonna organize this thousand hectare uh, hacienda, let's say let's plant it sugar, and then I'll deliver as a whole to the nearby sugar mill, sugar central, and there the, I can uh, justify the large economies of scale investment in the sugar central by assuring throughput. So that was the old way, but we don't have that anymore. These large scale hacendas uh, are now essentially a thing of the past, no? And there now has to be a collective action at the farm level. And this was also envisioned in the AFMA. So that kind of collective action, you need you know, a, a group of farmers together. And that's not really micro nor, nor necessarily macro. We call that the meso level, no? a, a more localized level of action. Uh, such clustering is also essential for, to, to generate a critical mass of support services. So for instance, if just one hub uh, raiser, uh, you know, just starts a, a hub business alone in a particular municipality, very difficult to access other ancillary services like veterinary services, right? Unless, um, but if there's a cluster of them, then yes, then there will be a, a uh, uh, it was worthwhile no, to, to uh, generate a cluster of support services uh, as well to that for that production cluster. So realizing this, AFMA posited uh, another set of um, interventions related to land use, so consolidate, planning, uh, irrigation, because normally irrigation is a kind of, especially in a gravity system, also involving uh, numerous side, uh, uh, contiguous uh, planters. Other infrastructure, roads, no, you don't just build for a single farmer, you build for a community, right? Uh, roads, bridges, uh, as well as organization of these farmers. So before you can just say individuals band together in collective action, usually that's the context of an organization. And that is uh, also an explanation for the various provisions of AFMA related to uh, empowerment. Uh, at least that's how I understand it. So uh, I'm putting together all of these uh, uh, various aspects of AFMA, which they call objectives. So when they say, these are the objectives of AFMA. This is essentially what modernization looks like from the viewpoint of RA8435, okay? It involves, mod uh, modernizing agriculture and fisheries involves shifting, transforming these sectors from a resource-based to a technology-based industry. So technology related, so that's one objective. Modernization involves enhancing profits and incomes in agriculture and fisheries, second objectives, and so on and so forth. No? So you can just read. Actually, what we did in the book is around each of these chapters, uh, in each of these objectives, we prepared a corresponding chapter uh, discussing whether indeed it happened that there are enhanced profits and incomes. Uh, there is a shift from resource-based to technology-based uh, industry for at the farm level, and so on and so forth. By the way, there's a tenth, but it's a kind of catch-all, increase the quality of life. So we just dropped that, no? And we went all the way to the ninth, which we emphasize there, uh, sustainability issues, no? uh, resource management, and so on, covered by the ninth, no? if you can read uh, the, the wording of that over there. So... Uh, reconfiguring these in light of the macro, meso, and micro constraints that I had previously discussed, we can put together uh, all of this in kind of a, the following chart. No, it's just my summary representation, 
where you have here the ultimate impact objectives on AFMA. So I'm going to read this from right to left, no? uh, uh, where you were aiming for the quality of life, better quality of life, as seen in higher incomes, improved food security, and more better protected uh, environment. And how is this to be accomplished? AFMA didn't just limit the focus on the farm itself, although there's heavy emphasis on that, but it realized even the farm can only prosper in the context of the entire value chain or set of values, uh, cascading values created by uh, the agriculture sector. So from resources to production, to processing, to distribution, and finally to consumption, this whole thing is called a value chain. And AFMA said the development should be all across this chain. Okay, so it should be you know, involved, involved farms as well as agri-related enterprises along this chain. And in fact, it realizes the importance of non-farm employment, albeit in rural areas. This is to be, the, these value chain interventions are organized in terms of policies which we classify as private sector enabling and direct provision. What do we mean? This is from the viewpoint of uh, public sector as it relates to private sector or the old argument of market and state, no? So this is uh, enabling the private sector as it works through markets, and this is more like direct provision by the, uh, by, by the state. So in the, under direct provision, it's easier to understand irrigation. So that's a uh, NIA function, right? So some, there are some private irrigation facilities, no doubt, but that's like 90, less than 1% of, of uh, all, in, uh, in most of it is uh, NIA organized, whether it's national or communal system, plus other infrastructure, prominently farm to market roads. Education, yes, there's a big chunk that is uh, private, privately provided, but in AFMA, what is really envisioned there is the public education system uh, from the uh, primary up to the tertiary level. Training of workers as well, R&D, uh, we envision there's a lack of a private sector uh, provided R&D and therefore a lot of the R&D for agriculture must not, probably uh, will, will be uh, produced in the government institutions themselves. So we have Picard, we have Phil Rice and other such related uh, research agencies run by government. Now there's also private sector enabling. So what do we mean by this? For example, credit. AFMA said government should restrict itself from direct credit programs. So unless it's a government state-owned uh, financial enterprise, it's not supposed to provide credit. So, and even that uh, state-owned enterprise, often the, it, it acts as a conduit no, to, to the private sector uh, financial service provider. So this is what we mean by private sector enabling. Zoning, so, uh, the, the government will set the rules for how land is gonna be used, but Setting up the buildings, the businesses, the residential areas, that will be the business of private sector. So this is what we mean by private sector enabling. Provision of information and marketing support. So the private sector will act on the information uh, and will do the actual uh, supply demand transactions, but there will be support for that coming from government. Uh, again, the, the, the private sector will produce the products, but according to the rules and product standards set by government, including food safety standards. There's also intervention for basic needs, uh, the encouragement of rural industrialization. So again, uh, this, this type of uh, element here of the value chain. And finally, trade and fiscal incentives to you know, spur private sector activity. So all of that, all of these uh, application of these policies is driven by principles, okay? Uh, in order to cure, as it were, these various constraints that we have uh, discussed previously. And these basic principles, let, let us reiterate, are empowerment, rational use of resources, global competitiveness, and allocating the budget according to these uh, principles, no? uh, through these policies to, to uh, transform this value chain and achieve these intended impacts. So that, in a nutshell, was the intention of the act. So now let's move to some of the uh, interesting uh, trends that we've seen in the past 25 years, whether this kind of vision for agriculture and fisheries actually materialized over uh, that fairly extended time frame. So uh, economic context, is the, was the economy modernizing? Well, apparently yes. If we look at per capita income as a measure, per capita income of the country has actually increased, no? 
from 1990 here. Uh, here is this the scale here on the right uh, for U.S. dollars. Uh, a little, uh, a little more than a thousand dollars here, all the way to uh, more than three thousand dollars as of 2019, a 53 percent uh, increase. So that is actually part of the process of economic modernization, and in fact, even that that growth is actually faster than the growth of the population tracked here, from 60 to over 100 million by 2019. And so that in per capita terms, the, uh, the, the, the in overall income per person has actually increased in the country. Again, this was mentioned already in the introduction. The share of agriculture is now down in terms of economic activity. In 1990, it's already below 20%. And that trend has continued down to less than 10% by 2020. What has happened is the share of industry is fairly constant. So when this receded, the share of agriculture, it was services that actually increased. So in terms of GDP shares, we're actually a service-based economy. That is also the case of employment. So if you can look at the Philippines, so about 23% uh, of, of the employment in 2019 in agriculture, up from 45% in 1991, no? early 90s. It's not unique to the Philippines. You can see here, this is the same similar trend in East Asia and Pacific, South Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Although note that we shed uh, 22 percentage points. So this is similar to the decline in South Asia. Less than that in East Asia and Pacific. This is driven largely by what happened in China. 32 percentage point decline over the same period. Although we're uh, a little bit faster than Sub-Saharan Africa, where it's still more than half of uh, their, their uh, workers are in agriculture down from 64% in 1991. Now, uh, growth of agricultural GVA is kept in similar pace uh, with other regions in the 1990s. That's the case of the Philippines. So if you look at the 1990s, this is 2.1% average growth for the decade, similar to East Asia and the Pacific, Latin America, and Caribbean, a little bit slower than Sub-Saharan Africa. That pace accelerated in the 2000s. What happened in the 2000s? There was a commodity price boom, especially from 2005 onward. So the agriculture responded by accelerating growth, but also the other uh, regions of the world also saw uh, accelerated growth of their agricultural sector. It was when the boom passed in the 2010s and Philippine growth sort of fell back to 1.7%, less than its pace in the 1990s. But the other countries managed to continue a uh, fairly rapid pace, relatively rapid pace of growth. No? So that uh, our growth rate of agriculture in the 2000s was just half of that of sub-Saharan Africa. So that to me is, uh, looks very striking. Now, agriculture in Philippines is more than half composed of crops. So you can see here, another 16% livestock, largely in uh, hog industry, swine industry then 14% in poultry, and another similar size fisheries, 14%. Now, if you break down the growth, uh, again, uh, in, in terms of five-year intervals, what you can see here is uh, the first half of 2010s, fairly rapid, most rapid growth in crops, uh, although faster in poultry, and even uh, rapid growth in fisheries. Similarly, uh, 2006 to 2010, slow down uh, across the board. But in 2011 to 15, that's where you see. So you, you, you saw these trends here, right? Uh, sudden drop here. Well, you can see here, there was a collapse in fisheries. There's now a contraction in fisheries. So it's very important. It's a sustainable issue. Sustainability issue in, in agricultural development is, is very important. There's also this um, uh, slowdown, continued slowdown of crops that was actually to continue throughout the decade. Uh, also, even poultry, long the uh, growth driver, has also slowed down, but not as much as the others, it's not, not as much as uh, crops and, and other lives. Although fisheries really uh, remained in contraction mode throughout most of the decade. All right, so. Growth can come from various um, sources. One way to grow your output is to add more inputs. So growth in the factors of production. So we can look at the trends here. 
uh, land is in this uh, um, orange line, you can't really expect land uh, to expand, especially in 20th century when we all, almost all country in the planet reached the agricultural land frontier. So from 11, hec 11 million hectares over a span of uh, 30 years, added just um, about a million hectares, uh, that, that's, that's about it, no? Uh, in terms of uh, workers, though, you can see here some sort of decline, and this could be largely driven by climate. But from 2000 onwards, there's that increase in the number of agricultural workers, which is expected because of growth of population. But interestingly, despite continued growth of population, from 2011 onwards, you have this decline in the actual absolute number of agricultural workers. A while ago, we saw a relative share in employment declining. Turns out that that's not just relative the share in terms of share. That's actually absolute number of workers was declining. So there was this accelerated decline in, in its uh, share of workers. And if that is the case, then land per worker since around 2011 was actually increasing somewhat no, uh, for the economy, but by a simple ratio, okay? Now, this is actually correlated with increasing capital stock. So, oh, I didn't have that chart, but uh, although we don't have very solid uh, data on capital stock, but we can infer, say, from uh, trends in gross domestic capital formation, limited to just breeding stocks and orchards, combining with some uh, mechanization data available from FAO, but also the, the capital stock in agriculture has also been increasing. Such that productivity per worker, so again, there's another source of growth, right? So aside from growth in the factors of production, we also have growth in productivity. So in terms of productivity per worker, it has been increasing. You know? So you can see that the Philippines here is this blue line, uh, translating this in, in um, uh, dollar terms so that we can compare it to other countries from uh, around $1,500 here up to around more than $3,000, similar to the growth in per capita income uh, overall. No? But this is dwarfed by... Uh, uh, what we can see in, uh, in other countries, especially in the high-income countries, sorry, this should be qualified as a right axis. High-income countries, they're achieving like almost $45,000 uh, uh, productivity per worker. That's really hyper-productive, no? Uh, but, the, but aside from, from uh, it, just East Asia, so going back to the left axis, they started out in early 90s, lower uh, GVA per worker, but they've uh, outstripped the Philippines by 2019. Again, this is largely driven by China. Uh, and this, this is South Asia. At least we're doing better than South Asia. Uh, we started out higher uh, in 1991, uh, but their growth has actually been fairly impressive. No, uh, this, is, this uh, conceals the, this, this trend line here conceals the fact that there was actually fairly rapid growth. Uh, this is largely driven, of course, by India. Now, even agri per worker, productivity per worker, is not a true sense of productivity. No? Real productivity is, with the same factors of production, you can actually increase your output. How is that possible? Well, that's, that's uh, one way, easy way to interpret this technology, right? Simply apply better technology. Uh, plant better seeds. So apply the same quantity of seeds, but it's a better seed, and you can get a... Uh, higher output uh, with, with similar management regime and so on. No? So all of these technological changes and other even improved production practices uh, are, are measured or captured by a measure called total factor productivity. And Philippines are actually uh, doing well in the 70s. Uh, but that's about it. Rest of the time, not so well, especially if you compare it with our neighboring economies. Okay, Not so well in 1960s. Uh, other countries were able to post uh, impressive growth, although except for Myanmar here, because that was a time of conflict uh, or, or uh, um, not a very good time for their, their country as a whole, the 1960s. No? Ours accelerated here, and remember this is the Green Revolution, so you have the 2.6%. But starting from an economic crisis and the lost development decade, even the Philippines had the lost development, uh, Philippine agriculture had the lost development decade with only a t uh, less than 1% TFP growth. Whereas a country like, say, Malaysia could muster, oops, could muster 3.1% TFP growth. And so on, no? so that uh, even if, the, the, if we continue the sad story, looking at the early 2010s, there was actually uh, negative TFP growth. So 
factors of production grew faster than what we would uh, expect, uh, grew faster than the rate of growth of the output. So that's why you have a negative uh, TFP growth, okay? Compared with, say, Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, and India, which all managed uh, positive and healthy rates of TFP growth. So again, this suggests that as an overview, something is not going very well for Philippine agriculture. All right. This can also be seen in our exports. So Philippine exports starting uh, in agriculture, agricultural exports. Uh, yeah, if you just look from the trend from 1980 to 2019, it quadrupled, more, uh, more, yeah, quadrupled. But uh, if you compare that with other countries, that, that's like peanuts, no? Uh, <laughs> Indonesia started out with uh, 4.8 billion compared to our 2.4 billion there and grew it to 43 billion by 2019, whereas we grew our exports to only just 7.2 billion. Likewise, Thailand from 3.7 grew it to, grew their agricultural exports to similar uh, to Indonesia, 43 billion. Even Vietnam, 3 billion, uh, starting 3 billion when they, the, the, the time series started, grew it to uh, 30 billion. So notice that the agricultural exports of Vietnam alone are bigger than our semiconductor, whole semiconductor exports of Philippines. Now that's pretty striking. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the increase was dwarfed by expansion uh, of agricultural exports in our, uh, our other neighbors. Note that Philippines, uh, experience declining share of agriculture in its aggregate exports. Uh, whereas uh, this is also the case for Thailand. So despite this declining share, uh, agricultural exports still managed to increase. So that's pretty impressive. Similarly for um, Vietnam, it's only Indonesia that managed to grow its agricultural exports, not only in absolute terms, but relative to its contribution to overall uh, merchandise exports. Uh, all right, so what do we make of these trends? Uh, I will not be able to provide sufficient explanation, but let me just at this juncture try to see what types of various program interventions were undertaken since passage of AFMA as they were reviewed in previous studies, no? and try to see whether there's some link or can be inferred to these overall trends. No? So let's start with land use. So this time I'm now reviewing previous, uh, there are actually two major, well, we can say three major no, uh, reviews. One done by University of Asia and the Pacific around 2008, 2009, well, starting 2007. Another by uh, the, the Development Academy of the Philippines, beginning with a rapid assessment in 2015, 2016, and more recently, 2020 to 2021, what they call a deep dive. So the next few slides, I'll be drawing on these. No? So first, uh, these reviews noted that AFMA did introduce in the area of land use, uh, an area-based approach to agricultural development planning. So central here is the concept of a strategic agriculture and fisheries development zone. So actually the, the, the AFMA posits a hierarchy of zones, starting from NPAAAD, you can read the full term there, no? irrigated areas, irrigable land. So uh, this kind of the universe of what we hope are agriculture or what could be suitable for agriculture, then narrowing it down to uh, centers where the development of agriculture and fisheries are catalyzed. No? And within those SAFDZs are model farms, uh, which are actually advancing or made suitable for economic scale production. So this was the, intro, the, the concept introduced. So this was actually the first intervention envisioned in the AFMA. However, the assessment is, the pursuit of area-based development was constrained by failure to properly delineate SAF disease. So no, we were not able to define, even define SAF disease, let alone use it as a meaningful concept, excuse me, in agriculture planning and programming. So the, the, the sum of it is uh, um, a lot of the delineation was uh, left to the local government units. And so when you total together their efforts and their definition of SAF disease, it actually exceeded the, uh, the land suitable for agriculture in the Philippines. So it was actually eating into the marginal lands, the pasture lands, the uplands. So naturally, the bigger your SAF disease, a lot of these politicians thought, 
the more funding you might be able to argue later from government. So that was the key driver behind this uh, mis, mis, uh, misdefinition, maldefinition of the South disease. Credit, Ahmad did, so on a positive note, at least in terms of its intention, Ahmad did reinforce an ongoing market-oriented reform in the agricultural credit system. So this resulted in a gradual shift of uh, small farmer loans from informal to formal lenders. Although the current reviews still note that financing of smallholder agriculture remains inadequate. So a lot of uh, small farmers, smallholders remain <clears throat> reticent to, to, uh, to borrow from the formal sector because of documentary requirements, as well as uh, lenders' uh, uh, unwillingness to absorb you know, risk and their perception of high risk of agriculture. So much so that in 2018 and 2019, government funded large, easy access credit programs. And this seems to be a deviation from what the AFMA propounded here, for market-oriented reform, because uh, they, it did not impose a market-determined interest rate. And insurance premiums were folded in and 100% subsidized for small farmers, at least uh, those cultivating not more than 1.5 hectares in geocritical hazard areas, so flood-prone areas, for example. Implements of marketing, uh, this time marketing. So AFMA said, let's support marketing no? uh, and information. Implementation of marketing provisions remains incomplete after 25 years. So according to AFMA, there should be a national marketing assistance program under an AM, uh, AMAS, under the DA. DA should set up a national information network, uh, etc. Now, Yes, there is an AMAS, you can go to DA and check, no? But its budget, according to the review, is far below what is needed to fulfill its mandate. And one reason for the lack of budget is that DA has a plenty of banner programs, such as the National Rice Program, the National Corn Program, the High Value Crops Program. They also have marketing uh, uh, functions. So it's assumed that say for the high value crops, the marketing is already being done. So it's a duplication. That's according to the assessment. Furthermore, uh, the National Marketing Assistance Program is yet to be established, rendering the marketing strategies of DA fragmented and incomplete. Look at, uh, considering the other provisions of AFMA, product standards. So yes, AFMA provided for imposition uh, for the establishment of products uh, standards for agriculture and fisheries. In fact, this was advanced later with the Food Safety Act uh, of 2013, much later. However, there's, these standards are still to be adopted voluntarily. So for example, good agricultural practices, there's a standard for Philippines, but this is not imposed as, a, as, a, as mandatory, unlike say in the case of Thailand, where if you're an exporting, uh, agricultural exporter, uh, you must comply with the Thai gap. <clears throat> uh, there are rural non-farm employment initiatives under AFMA. They have not taken off. There are trade and fiscal incentives provided under AFMA, but if you look at the record, they have benefited mostly large enterprises. All right, so getting to the end, uh, I, I may have overextended, but uh, I have not actually provided a uh, an answer to the questions with which I started this. No? Uh, nor was this talk intended to actually answer those questions. This is supposed to be an overview. The actual detailed answer will be provided in the book and presented, say, in a book launch to be done uh, fairly soon. But just to jump the gun on that book launch and not to leave you hanging, uh, here, is the, uh, here are some of the, um, the answers to the questions, no? key findings uh, that kind of summarize the entire book. All right, so was agriculture and fisheries in Philippines successfully modernized? Answer, progress has been made, but not really modernized according to those objectives. And in fact, with business as usual, if we have been conducting our strategies and programs and actions as the next 25 years, as in the first 25 years, no, they will not see it being modernized even in the short to medium term, say within this incoming administration. So what is needed to successfully uh, pursue this modernization? So I have uh, identified there sort of clusters of recommendations, one, two, three, four, five. Yes, five, to abandon elements of traditional industrial policy inconsistent with the market approach, which is one of the objectives of AFMA. 
To phase out the current programs of producer support in the, if, in the form of elevated price policies towards expenditure programs, no actual, you know, rather than artificially propping up the price, say, of hogs, uh, actually have an expenditure program to develop the livestock value chain. However, uh, the current type of uh, expenditure programs also cannot, the status quo of the design of expenditure programs also cannot be uh, implemented uh, and expect to see modernization because they're mostly based on distortionary subsidies. They should rather give way to funding a modern industrial policy for the agri-food system. And this is discussed in detail in the um, value chains uh, ladder chapter in the book. No? So all of this should be based on a set of programs that are established through what I call an area-based bottom-up planning approach. So rather than the top-down banner program centric type of planning, especially centered on rice, uh, as is customary in many DA strategies, uh, we have to shift away from that and move to a more area-based approach as is originally envisioned in AFMA. And from there, you provide a set of strategic interventions to meet the needs of farmers and rural enterprises along the value chain. So this, this is actually part of a adoption of a modern industrial policy away from the old traditional style of industrial policy uh, where you rely heavily on protection, actually protection, protection, protection. Instead of protection, you need uh, uh, modern industrialization based on strategic interventions, not necessarily uh, stopping cheap imports from coming in. And finally, I think uh, it was striking that uh, one of the, uh, if you've been listening to the video, uh, one of the people interviewed in the video, <laughs> of you know, the standard stock video that uh, PIDS uh, shows before these webinars, monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. And that's actually how uh, we close this. Adopt a results-based monitoring approach to the agriculture and fisheries modernization plan. There is actually a program benefit monitoring and evaluation system built into the law itself, Republic Act 8435. But sadly, this was not implemented. So this should now be reestablished re-energized and taken seriously and with monitoring, 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 hopefully we'll be able to make sure that there's follow through in these first four clusters of recommendations. With that, I conclude this presentation. Thank you very much.